Well, I am from uh, Hannibal, Missouri, and uh, so I like to quote Mark Twain. Uh, I didn't know him, but uh, Mark Twain wrote this, some men worship ranks, some worship heroes, some worship power, some worship God, and over all these idol, or ideals they dispute and cannot unite, but they all worship money. Of course, he was talking tongue-in-cheek like he often did, but there's a lot of truth to what he says. We've been talking about the various idols in our culture, the various gods, and today we come to what I believe is the number one idol, the most popular god in America, and that's the god of money. I believe more folks uh, sacrifice at the altar of money than at any other shrine, that more bow down to gold than they do to God. In fact, that should be the motto on our coins, in gold we trust. Of course, it wouldn't quite be right because our money isn't backed by gold anymore, but you know, you get the idea. Jesus indicated that there is little else that competes for our attention and our affection and, and, and worship more than money because he said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And he never said that about any other thing in life. Money is God's chief competitor for our attention, for our worship. And it has been for a long time. If you look at the oldest book in the Bible, the main character, named, a guy named Job, said, I have not put my trust in gold or said to pure gold, you are my security. I have not celebrated my great wealth or the riches my hands had gained. If I had, these also would have been sins to be punished because I would have been unfaithful to God. If you would take out the orange insert in your bulletin, uh, it gives you some things to follow along, uh, blanks to fill in. And open your Bible. The whole sermon this morning is going to be from Luke, the 12th chapter. The other day I was reading, happened to be reading in the Gospels, and I was reading, I was in Luke in my quiet time, and every year I read through the New Testament once, the Old Testament twice, in about every, about every nine and a half months, and I try to get a different version of the Bible each time. And this time I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. So most of the quotations today are going to be from the complete Jewish Bible. Very good translation. Uh, one quirk that it has is that it uses some Hebrew words instead of English on occasion. But it has a great gl glossary in the back of the Bible so you can see what the Hebrew word means. So anyway, as I was reading from Luke, beginning in chapter 5, this passage in Luke 12 really jumped out at me in a way it never had before. And I noticed, starting in chapter 5, that Luke just keeps mentioning the tremendous crowds that showed up, that were following Jesus, walking along. And so I began circling these statements that said people were pressing around him, huge crowds, great numbers of people, a large crowd. One time it said crowds on every side virtually choking him, crowds hemming him in. And then if you look at, look at Luke chapter 12 and the very first verse, uh, it says, uh, let me get there, uh, a crowd in the tens of thousands. Just think about that crowd. The tens of thousands gathered so closely as to trample each other. Now, Jesus was healing and helping and encouraging. He, he was teaching. He, he was even feeding them. Remember, in chapter 9, he fed ten or 12,000 people uh, from a few loaves and a few fish. This was the second year of his ministry. It was known as the year of popularity, obviously, if he had that many crowds. And, and I began to circle, notice other words as he taught. And so I began to circle the words amazed and astonished or astounded. At least 10 times, it, it says that people were just mesmerized by what he said, by the way he talked. So in the midst of all this great teaching that was just astounding people, Luke tells us in verse 13 of chapter 12, someone in the crowd said to him, Rabbi, tell my brother to share with me the property that we inherited. So Jesus is here mesmerizing people with his words as he focuses on spiritual things, and here's this dude in the crowd, and what's he focused on? Money. The inheritance. So Yeshua, that's Jesus' name in the complete Jewish Bible, that's his, his Hebrew name, Yeshua, decides to take this opportunity to give a warning against the God of money. So look there in verse 15. Then to the people he said, be careful to guard against all forms of greed, because even if someone is rich, his life does not consist 
in what he owns. Now, what is greed? Well, the, the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and, and the Greek word for greed that's used here is pleonexius, which was a compound of two Greek words. One of them means have, and one of them means more, and that's what greed, greed is. It's have moreishness. It's the desire, the constant desire for more. When we bow down to the God of wealth, we just have to have more. And Jesus says here, do whatever you can to guard against the desire for more. So Jesus is saying, stop wanting more. What's the positive way of saying it? Well, the Holy Spirit tells us in Hebrews 13, be content with what you have. That's the positive side. But that's un-American, isn't it? To be content with what you have. Can you be an American and not want more and bigger and better? Jesus is really uh, coming right on to us. Jesus says that one of the major ways that we dethrone the God of money is by being content with what we have. In spite of what the Super Bowl marketers want us to know, you know, all the advertisements and stuff, what they want us to believe is that we've got to have more and better and bigger. And Jesus says, no, that's not right. Life does not consist of what we have. Life does not consist of our possessions. Well, what does life consist of? What does life consist of? If it doesn't consist of our possessions, and keep in mind that that's our lover who's telling us that. Jesus, the one who really cares about us, the one who wants the best for us, the one who loves us enough to give his life for us, to give us real life, abundant life, eternal life, he says, life does not consist in your possessions. Do we believe him? What is life? Well, again, listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says God has given us eternal life, and this life This real life, this abundant life, is in his Son. He that has the Son has the life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. People who don't know Jesus aren't living. They're existing, but they don't have life. Jesus said, I am the life. In fact, he said it twice. So beware of the God of money, because it steals your life. The God of money steals your life. Now, to bolster this warning, Jesus gives them an illustration against the God of money in verse 16. He says, there was a man whose land was very productive. He debated with himself, what should I do? I haven't enough room for all my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And I'll store all my wheat and other goods there. And then I'll say to myself, you're a lucky man. You have a big supply of goods laid up for many years to come. Start taking it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, he was patting himself on the back, but God said to him, you fool. See, in his own eyes, he was a huge success. And God says, you fool, this very night, your soul, you know, you're going to die. And the things you prepared, whose will they be? And then Jesus drives home the point. He says, that's how it is with anyone who stores up wealth for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus doesn't say it's wrong to store up wealth. He says you store up wealth for yourself and not being rich toward God. See, God is a jealous lover. I'm a jealous lover. I hope you are too. God won't share his heart with any, or, you know, my heart, with anybody else. 41 years ago, I pledged my love to Karen. She pledged her love to me. If I remember it right, it went something like this. I will keep myself to you and to you alone as long as we both shall live. And I'm a jealous lover. I won't share her love with any other human being. And God won't share our love with anyone else. He is the source of our life. He is the the sustainer of our life. He is the strength of our life. And he wants to be the love of our life. He won't allow us to share that love with anybody else. And this wealthy landowner didn't give any thought to God. Who did he think made those crops grow? Who did he think made that land productive? All he thought of was himself. If you'll look... In these three verses, ten times, he uses the word I, me, mine, mine, myself. The God of money 
not only steals our life, he steals our priorities. He steals our values. This man stored up wealth for himself without being rich toward God. And the way we're rich toward God is being rich toward other people. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And then in verses 22 to 28, we hear Jesus' lesson against the God of money. It says, to his Talmudim, and that's the, that's the Hebrew word for disciple, follower, those who have put their trust in and follow Jesus. Yeshua said, because of this, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Think about the ravens. They neither plant nor harvest. They have neither storerooms nor barns, yet God feeds them. You're worth a lot more than the birds. Can any of you by worrying add an hour to his life? And if you can't do a little thing like that, why worry about the rest? Think about the wild irises and how they grow. They neither work nor spin thread. And yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not clothed as beautifully as one of those flowers. If this is how God clothes the grass, which is alive today in the field and thrown into the oven tomorrow, how much more will he clothe you? What little trust you have. Now, I've taught on that passage so many times about the danger of worry and the sinfulness of of anxiety. But see, that's not Jesus' primary thought in that passage. He's talking about how the God of money not only steals our life and steals our, our values, our priorities, he steals our trust. If we put our trust in God instead of in money, we would never worry because God has promised to provide for us. He has promised to take care of us. He has promised to meet our needs. As Jesus reminds us, he feeds the birds. He clothes the flowers. They don't worry and fret and run around with anxiety. How much more valuable are his children? That's why God says, uh, Paul says in, in, uh, in Philippians, the book of Philippians, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And all your needs is pretty inclusive. In fact, Peter also chimes in, give all your worries to him, all your anxieties to him, because he cares about you. He loves you. He cares for you. He provides for you. When we, like the rich farmer, place our trust in our salaries, in our savings, in our 401ks, in in our... uh, insurance policies and the things that we have stored up we have allowed the god of money to steal our trust in god we've begun to trust gold instead of god no wonder jesus said with amazement what little trust you have if we're anxious we're not trusting our father to do what he said there are three ways that the god of money steals our trust all of them seen in this story of the rich fool. First of all, he viewed money as the source of his security. I mean, notice how he congratulated himself. He says, you're a lucky man. You, you've got this big supply of goods laid up that's going to last for many years, so start taking it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. I mean, he thought, man, I've got it made. I can just sit back and enjoy life. He had no idea, did he? Not at all. He thought he was secure. He thought all those those possessions made him secure. He had not a care in the world, but God says in the very next verse, you fool. You think you're a success. You're a fool. This very night, you're going to die. He thought he was set for life because of all that. When we depend upon our money, putting our trust in it, we're putting it in the place of God. It's become our God. Think about how much of our worry and anxiety is related to money or what money can buy. But money really has nothing to do with security. It can be taken from us or we can be taken from it at any time, just like this man was. There'll be no money in heaven. The only coin in heaven is our character. That's what's valuable. Money is only for this life. It is simply a tool to be used for God and for good. It's never a God that we should worship or place our trust in. How foolish to put our trust in something that doesn't last as long as we do. 
You see, you and I are forever. This earth and everything in it is going to be destroyed, but people last forever. And so we need a God that lasts forever, a God that's eternal. He was putting his hopes, his dreams, his dependence upon money, and money is just a mighty insecure foundation to build your hopes on. Only God can be the source of our security because only he will always be there. He'll never fail us. He'll never forsake us. But he viewed money as the source of his security. Secondly, he viewed money as the source of his satisfaction. I mean, you can just hear the joy, the satisfaction when you read this story. He was so excited that he had so much more than he had room for. He was almost giddy as he thought about building more and building bigger. And he nearly broke his arm patting himself on the back. He was just so satisfied with the opportunity to sit back, relax, you know, live life large, enjoy, you know, wine and dine and just enjoy what he had. I mean, there's no doubt he was really excited, enjoying that prosperity for about six or eight hours. It just didn't last. But you know what? That's never enough. The God of money is never enough to really satisfy us. See, he was already, evidently, as you read between the lines here, this guy was already very prosperous. He was already a very wealthy landowner, a farmer, even before this abundant harvest, yet he wanted more, probably because he thought just a little bit more will satisfy me. I'm not quite satisfied. There's still something missing, but a little bit more of this, and I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. Reminds me of the story of of John Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil in 1900, and became the wealthiest man. Well, he founded it before that, but by 1900, he was the wealthiest man in the world. And a reporter asked him one time, how much money is enough? And he just said, a little bit more. Solomon, I think, gets at the truth. He was the wealthiest man that ever lived. He was also, other than Jesus, the wisest man that ever lived. And Solomon said, whoever loves money will never be satisfied with money. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with more income. The Bible tells us God has richly provided us everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to enjoy life. Just like we want our children to enjoy life. God gives us good things for our enjoyment. He, he, that's what he wants. He wants us to delight in the things of this earth that he gives to us. Jesus certainly enjoyed life. He had a great time with people. I mean, he relished the parties and the dinners that he went to. And one time as he gathered with his disciples for the Seder meal, he told them, I have really looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you. In fact, the Greek uses a Hebrew, Hebrew expression. They call them Hebrewisms. Uh, with, with desire, I have desired to eat this meal with you. In other words, he really wanted to be with them. He enjoyed being with them. He enjoyed a good party. God wants us to enjoy life. He's given us everything for our enjoyment. The difference between Jesus and people today is that Jesus realized that God was the one who provided the things for us to enjoy. Those things are not the source of our joy. God is the source of those things. God is the source of that joy. Thirdly, he viewed money as the source of his significance. I mean, just look at how much of this passage is about himself. How many, how many times he talked, you know, I just said, how many, ten, ten different times he uses the word I, me, my, myself. He found his identity in his money, in his possessions. I remember when I was a kid, somebody had died, I don't remember who. Mom and dad were sitting around the kitchen table, and I remember he- hearing them say, I wonder what he was worth. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing to say when a guy dies. But of course, as I grew up, I realized he was talking about net worth. Mom mom and dad were talking about net worth. What is unfortunate in our culture is we confuse net worth with self-worth. We measure our value by the valuables that we have. Let me just tell you what I'm worth. I am of infinite value to God. I am worth the sacrifice of his son. I am worth more than anything on this earth. And you are too. Jesus loves us so much that he gave his life for us. See, that's where our significance comes from, in his love for us. That's where our self-worth comes from, from the unlimited, 
unending, unsurpassed love of God. And nothing, the Bible says, nothing will ever be able to separate us from God's love. So nothing can steal our significance, our value. To him, we're of infinite value when we find that value in Jesus. Now, is it possible that you have made money one of your gods or your primary god? that you have ascribed to money some of the divine attributes and have looked at money to provide your security. You've expected money to make you happy, to give you satisfaction. You've confused your self-worth with your net worth. Now, if you've done that, the final thing that Jesus does here in our text is the most important. Having exposed the God of money, he concludes by explaining how to dethrone the God of money in our hearts. There are three things here in Luke 12 to help us dethrone the money as a God in our hearts and the hold that it has on our lives when he steals our heart. We've really already mentioned the first two briefly. Number one is contentment. God says true godliness True godliness, focusing on him with contentment itself, is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich have fallen into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. If you want to avoid the sorrows of the God of money, you simply need to be content with what you have. The Bible says never be content with what you are. Always be growing. Closer in your relationship with Jesus, more in love with him. But always be content with what you have, because contentment emasculates the God of wealth. A second thing that helps us depose uh, the God of money from the throne of our hearts, recognizing that I don't own anything. I relinquish ownership. God is the source of wealth, and he is the owner of everything. Everything belongs to God by the right of creation. The psalmist sang it this way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Every beast of the forest is mine, declares the Lord, the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything that moves is mine, the world, and all it contains is mine. Moses said, behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heaven, the earth and all that is in it. And so Moses says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to make wealth. You and I don't own anything. It all belongs to God, and he has loaned it to us. He has given all good things for our enjoyment. He has entrusted it to us to manage for him. Even what we earn is by his power. For 41 years, that's been the key principle in my life to help me from making money into a God. God. These three principles I have put into practice in my life. What I have is not mine. It is his That's why he is as concerned about what I spend for my cell phone as he is with what I put into the offering plate. It's not my money. Everything I have, my relationships, my possessions, my work, my body, my mind, they're all gifts that God has loaned to me. And one day he's going to call me to give an account for how I have managed my life, my money, my possessions, my relationships. And so my desire, my goal, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, I believe it is, is to be a faithful manager of what he's entrusted to me. We dethrone the God of money by realizing that we don't own anything. And the final way we dethrone the God of money is simply by giving generously. Look at it in verses 30 to 34. He says, in other words, don't strive after what you'll eat and what you'll drink. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. For all the, for all the pagan nations in the world, set their hearts on these things. But your Father, 
Your heavenly Father who loves you knows that you need them too. Rather, seek his kingdom. Seek, seek him. Focus on him. And all these things will be given to you as well. Have no fear, little flock. The Father desires to give you his kingdom. Look at that. Sell what you own and give to charity. Give to the needy. Make for yourselves purses that don't wear out. He doesn't say sell all you own. He just says give generously where, where, where you're making for yourselves purses that don't wear out, riches in heaven that will never fail, where no burglar comes near, where no moth destroys, for where your, where your wealth is, that's where your heart will be also. What is he saying? Put Christ first. Make Jesus your king. Make him number one. Seek his will. Seek his kingdom. Give generously of what you have, your time, your money, your energy, your possessions to help others. You live, you invest your life to be a blessing to those around you. And when you do that, you're storing up treasure in heaven. Your calendar and your checkbook will show where your heart is and your heart will be where Christ is. Giving your money to bless others, to build God's kingdom, breaks the power of materialism in our life. It dethrones the God of money because when we give generously, we are telling that God that he is so unimportant that far from hoarding him, we can just give him away. You hoard what you value. But what is not your God, you just give away. Where is your trust? Are you trusting in God or in gold? Are you looking for money to do for you what only God can do? Maybe that's why you don't sense any contentment and satisfaction in your life. Maybe that's why you don't feel secure, why you're fraught with worry and anxiety. Maybe that's where, why, why there's that feeling that something is missing. The God of money has stolen your priorities. He has stolen your values. He has stolen your trust. He has stolen your heart, and he's made off with your life. And Jesus says, Make me king, and I will give you life more abundantly. Take these three steps. Be content with what you have. Realize that you don't own anything. You're simply God's manager of what he's provided to you. He wants you to enjoy it, but he wants you to manage it. It's not yours. And seek first his kingdom. Make Jesus alone your Lord and your God, and give generously to be a blessing to others. Make that your goal in life. On the back of your connection card, there are three steps I'd, in, I'd encourage you to take in addition to those steps, but I mean some practical steps. Get into Financial Peace University. We have it on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Get into that class whenever we offer it next because that class will teach you how to be a good and faithful manager of the resources that God has entrusted to you. And I can tell you, financial peace. Peace is the big thing that will come when you learn to manage money God's way. The second one, take the 201 class. We've got it this afternoon. The 101 class is for membership. It's for guests that want to learn about Valley View and, and understand a class that I teach this afternoon. So I encourage you to come to that. If you're a guest and want to learn more about Valley View, have a free lunch with us and, and, and come to the 101 class. But the 201 class teaches us the four habits, spiritual habits, that will just keep us growing and growing in our love relationship with Jesus. And if you've not been in that class, I would encourage you, we've revamped the whole thing. And then thirdly, maybe re-listen to this merit, uh, message on our, on our website this week. Look over your calendar, look over your checkbook, and, and really look at, have I made money my God? Let's pray as we close. Father, we just thank you for this gentle warning from your word. We thank you always for how much you love us and care about us, how that you want the best for us. So, Father, help us to practice these three steps. Help us to be content with what we have. Help us to relinquish ownership, to realize that we're simply managers of all those things that you've entrusted to us for our enjoyment. Help us to enjoy them, but not to make them our God. And help us, Lord, to seek first your kingdom, to put you first in our lives, and to give generously that we might be a blessing. Give generously of our time and service of our talents and ministry, of our money, that we might be a blessing to those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, asking that you use them to dethrone the God of money in our lives and in our hearts.